Hello and welcome to Starside Cafe. We just saw Isle of Dogs today, so we thought we would sit down and discuss it. Uh, joining me, is, as usual, is Aaron Capo. Hello. Hey, and I'm Zach, as usual. This is another. This is the second episode of Starside Flicks. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I I, I like that name. I totally forgot that we. Uh, started naming this segment. I only remembered it because I just made the thumbnail for the video, so I had to title it. Nice. Uh, so yeah, we're both big fans of uh, Wes Anderson, so maybe this will be a tad, uh, you know, one-sided. But um, tell me, I, I guess, start off. Tell me how you felt about the movie. I was very pro the movie, Zach. I liked it a lot. I got a little teary-eyed multiple times. It was very good. It tugged at the heartstrings. The animation was good. It was, uh, I don't know. I felt like the animation was the was slightly the thing I didn't like about it because it was, I mean, it was definitely very beautiful and the models were very beautiful and all the detail was like, it was very detailed and you could tell that they took a lot of time. I mean, it's a Wes Anderson movie, so already this is probably his dream is being able to control literally everything in frame. Right. Uh, so, like, as usual, the cinematography and everything was great. I just thought that I wanted I wanted the animation to be a little smoother, like, I don't know, higher frame rate. I don't think about animation. But at times I felt like I I wanted increased fluidity. But overall, I didn't really notice that. That's my probably my only criticism of the movie. Other than that, I found it to be spectacular. Yeah. Uh, so I I think it's like the dog's uh, fur flowing a lot that sort of gives that impression a little bit. I felt kind of the same way about Fantastic Mr. Fox because uh, I think it's so like intricately detailed, like the miniature sets that they use and the different mm -hmm. character models. And, beautiful sets. Yeah, very, very beautiful. Uh, there's one set in particular in Isle of Dogs that's made up of, like, empty sake bottles. Oh, yes, I was going to bring that up, too. And that's a beautiful set. It's such a, yeah, such a beautiful set. And, like, one of the scenes in there is, like, the all the dogs talking in silhouette. It's just a mm -hmm. very, very uh, beautifully designed set and very well shot. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a little bit weird. I don't know if it's the frame rate or if it's just sort of like an exaggerated, um, like movement of fur that sort of gives that impression, but I, it does look a little bit unnatural. Um, but that, yeah, that's a, a very minor, minor gripe. Very minor. And what and I would so consider a very beautiful movie. The first thing I asked you when we were leaving the theater was... Did you like it more than Fantastic Mr. Fox, which is the obvious question, but you reminded me that you had an interesting experience when you saw Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah, uh, so when I was studying in LA for a semester, I got the chance to go to see a, a like a, a kind of private screening. It was like a large group of people, but it was like invite only, I guess. Uh, so we got a screening of Fantastic Mr. Fox, which had just come out uh, a few months before that and uh, yeah after the screening ended Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach came out to do a Q&A so I, it was a very fun night and I really enjoy the movie to begin with but uh, just the fact that I also got to have this uh, very special experience because I got to like see uh, Wes Anderson up close uh, and like shake his hand and uh, take a picture with him and everything. Um, so maybe there's a little bit of sentimentality there of why I would consider that movie better than Isle of Dogs. But I I think it's hard to rank Wes Anderson movies. It's true. I mean, but do it right now. Hmm. It's... Including the uh, credit card commercial. Oh, he has so many commercials, though. Does he? I only know about the credit card one. Oh, there's a ton. Oh, of I ones. guess there was that Stella Artois one. There was more than that. Oh. He uh, he did one for, he does some for like fashion 
outlets as well. Like there was uh, Castello Cavalcante where Jason Schwartzman was like a race driver and like mm. uh, that one was a funny one. That's uh, similar to the plot of Neo Yokio. Is it? I've never seen that. Well, you should check it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they say that Neo Yokio is uh, an anime inspired by Wes Anderson. Do they? Some people have said it is if if Wes Anderson made an anime, that's what it would be. But I have said that it's more like if someone who likes Wes Anderson made an anime, that's what it would be. Oh, okay. Like imitation Wes Anderson? Very imitation. Mm. Uh, I, I would either put Royal Tenenbaums or Grand Budapest Hotel at the top. Mm-hmm. And Rushmore would be right after that. Those are the like easy favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, it gets very messy. It's hard to rank them from there. <laughs> uh, probably Fantastic Mr. Fox. And then um, I, I don't want to do the rest of this. <laughs> it's too hard. Na- <laughs> well, name, I get, it, name where you would put it, I guess. Uh, Well, so I have always loved... The Life Aquatic, and that is my favorite Wes Anderson movie. Maybe I, it's for nostalgic reasons, but for whatever reason, that's like when I got my like uh, second edition or whatever generation iPod, it was the first one that had video on it, and I only had Life Aquatic, the movie Hackers, which is the greatest movie ever made, <laughs> and uh, the Mystery Science Theater for Puma Man on my iPod. So whenever I traveled or whenever I did anything where I had to like hang out, I would either listen to music or I would watch Life Aquatic or Hackers. Uh, so I have watched the Life Aquatic a lot of times and just love everything about it. I love the bisected ships that they walk around in. Yeah. I like Jeff Goldblum's character. Uh, everything about that movie I love. But well, so I'd say that would be number one. And then Rushmore. And then Royal Tenenbaums. And famously, I have never seen Grand Budapest Hotel. I think I'm saving... Did you ever watch uh, Battlestar Galactica? Yeah. Do you remember how General Adama, or what was he, an admiral? I don't remember, but the old guy, uh, Gaff from Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah. He had that book that he was waiting to read until he was sure he was going to die. Oh, so this was the thing. You told me that you were waiting and you were going to watch Grand Budapest Hotel right before whatever his next movie was. Because That was the plan. Because you, also... you knew that if you watched that, you would just want more Wes Anderson. So you're like, I'm going to plan it so that I can watch that movie and then go to another movie of his. Very true. Another thing about Grand Budapest Hotel is I was very upset that I had not seen it in theaters. For whatever reason, I just like... I couldn't make it to the theater for the long amount of time that it was available. And so my plan has always been to somehow see it in a theater, probably a virtual reality theater if possible. So you could probably when, do that right now actually. Yeah, but the fidelity is not good enough yet. Yeah. I need like 4K per eye in order to get like adequate. So maybe when second generation, I guess what I'm saying is uh my the date that I'm going to watch Grand Budapest Hotel uh, Hotel is still up in the air. <laughs> I have offered uh, many, many times to uh, I know. like go watch it with you. To, I have like, the Blu-ray. Yeah, somehow make you watch this movie, and it still hasn't happened. But it's great. I know, man. It's like that. It's like that uh, book that Adama has. I just like I'm waiting until maybe when they announce that there's a comet that's finally gonna destroy all of us, I'll pop it in. And then you can come over. Is it one of those things where you like put it on your bucket list and now you're like, well, now I have to wait for that day when, you know, they say a little bit. I only built it up so much. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I've built it up so much and I just, uh, it needs to be a very special time for me to watch it or I need to be able to, I mean, so another thing about my past is that, uh, I worked in an, an independent movie theater for three or four years of my life. And so I got very used to, Two, I believe two Wes Anderson movies came out while I was doing that. But anyway, like all we would always just like wait until we closed. And then at like midnight or one in the morning when everybody left, we would just screen movies in empty theaters. And so I got very used to doing that. And I hate people talking. I've had such terrible experience. Even when we went today, yeah. there was that 
little kid talking behind us, and it was driving me insane. Yeah. So, I don't know. I want a perfect experience, which I feel like is very hard to get in movie theaters. Well, you just need VR to get better. Anyway, this is not true. this is not the point of this uh, this thing that we're doing right now. Uh, virtual reality. A virtual reality. Also, <laughs> Isle of Dogs. Uh, so, I like there has been a lot of criticism about the movie that we probably can't do any sort of talk about Isle of Dogs without at least acknowledging. Yeah, um, I had not heard about this, but you said you wanted to talk about it. Yeah, so like I could tell as we were watching it that it was sort of leaving itself open to some of the criticism, um, and I haven't spent too much time getting into all of that, but uh, there's been a lot of articles written about uh, sort of cultural appropriation uh, with this movie because I guess it is obviously a white writer-director making a movie set in a, a different culture. So I guess it makes sense that people would bring it up, but um, I think some of it's uh, maybe gone a little too far. I mean, I'm also like a you know a white guy who likes movies, so maybe disregard everything I say anyway. But <laughs> um, but yeah, the conversation around the movie has been kind of dominated by that, and so it, a lot of like the other interesting themes of the movie has been sort of lost a little bit, but. Um, and I think to an extent people sort of confuse, get confused when talking about appropriation. Um, like they, uh, maybe aren't willing to accept like appreciation, you know? Mm. Uh, cause like Anderson is like very fond of old movies. He's like a, a pastiche artist, right? Where uh, all of his movies are sort of heavily inspired by like classic movies, like, Obviously, for Isle of Dogs, he's inspired by Kurosawa and, like, the stop-motion animation movies of, like, Rankin Bass in, like, the 1960s or whatever. Um, and so I guess maybe the fact that it's also an animated thing, it sort of uh, leads to some maybe over-the-top caricaturing of, like, iconography. Yeah, that first... I think that like the very first time someone talked, it was the mayor, Mayor Kobayashi, and he. I mean, I'm sure the voice actor is Japanese, but like, yeah, he leaned very heavily into like. I I was like, whoa, this is gonna be like very Japanese. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I, I was like, it made me a little uncomfortable, but then like it kind of evened out, and like everyone else was normal. I think he was just meant to be like very overbearing, but like he had a very thick, like very stereotypical accent. I felt. Yeah, uh, there's some of that going on, I think. Um, naming also, I thought. like Yeah, and the naming was usually the other fine, one. But yeah, his henchman was called Major Domo, which I thought was yeah. like, they probably could have thought of a better name. Also, right. only, you only, I think you only hear it one time, but that one scientist lady, her name was Yoko Ono for no reason. Well, because she was played by Yoko Ono. Oh, is that true? Yeah. So like the voice... Wait, was she playing herself? I, I, yeah, it's confusing. I don't know. Like, That's crazy. So, some to me. of it, some of the decisions made were a little bit uh, bizarre. I thought that's one of them. It's uh, uh, some of it felt kind of like first draft and didn't get changed. Maybe, um, but those are sort of the the I guess marks against the movie that people are are talking about. Um, but. Uh, at the same time, like, I guess I don't, like, I wouldn't be bothered by, like, uh, foreign filmmakers making movies set in America. Like, I've never been uh, offended by, like, South Korean kimchi westerns, as they're called, like, The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. You know that movie? Yeah, if, uh, that's I've seen the cover of it a bunch of times with that big uh, Gatling gun. Yeah, like, it's a Western movie, or, or Western-themed, I guess, but it's, like, a Korean movie. Uh, and then there was, like, this Thai movie uh, called Tears of the Black Tiger that I guess is, like, both an homage uh, and a parody of, like, classic Hollywood Westerns. Uh, and I enjoyed both of those movies, and I wasn't at all offended by them. So, like, I think at, at some point... Um, I appreciate like 
uh, like other cultures taking interest in like a style or genre of film from like like America or our past. And so sort of seeing that um, like a, a different artist uh, trying to adapt it to their style, I think is interesting. And I'm kind of in favor of that usually. Uh, so I guess I don't know why people are getting so upset about it. But then again, it's also not my culture in this case that's being uh, rendered by somebody else. Very true. Uh, but I think uh, the bottom line for me anyway was that I, d- I didn't think that the appropriation was offensive. So, like, the the classic example of, like, offensive cultural appropriation is, like, Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Where Which you, I have never seen. Uh, but it, it's, like, this, he's doing this really, like, offensive impression of, like, an Asian person. Uh, and it, like, obviously at the time, I guess they didn't know what they were doing. But, like, now it seems very mean-spirited. Uh, But in this case, with Isle of Dogs, like, they're not mocking people or making them the butt of the joke. So it didn't feel exploitative to me. Um, Like, the one article that I read that I I really kind of agreed with um, was by Emily Yoshida on Vulture. I, I wrote down the quote... She said, at no point do I think that Wes Anderson is suggesting that his 2028 stop motion version of a fictional city represents anything real or accurate about Japanese culture. It's a look. I mean, you could swap it out for, say, Finland and not much would change. If I'm playing cultural appropriation cop, I'd file it under benign. And yeah, so I kind of agreed with that take on it. So I... Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it didn't really bother me, but I guess I'm not the person that would have been bothered by it, if that makes <laughs> sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, I thought that needed to be mentioned at some point. Duly noted. Uh, so how do you feel about the story? Because I guess I have other, like, minor criticisms. Because, again, overall, I really like the movie, and I think it's great. Uh, but I did have, like, a few minor things. I think that Wes Anderson, and I don't know about, obviously, like, we already talked about that I don't know about Grand Budapest Hotel. But I feel like he, in general, needs for a real downer thing to happen at some point towards the end of the movie. For instance, Owen Wilson dying in Life Aquatic. Or uh, when those kids die in Darjeeling Limited. yeah. Or just like something that kind of like breaks the flow and everyone can just get sad for a while. And so I was very worried initially when they, I guess I guess we're going to talk about spoilers. So from this point on, we're, maybe we've already done it, but we're going to talk yeah. a lot about spoilers. But uh, like when, when they, first time they get to that cage and you see that dog that has just died in the cage, I was like, oh man, this is like, this is a real bummer. But then... That was a misdirect and everything was fine. And then there was the other the other misdirect where you thought that he died at the end of the movie and then he was totally fine. Which so like, I kind of didn't like. I liked that. I like really? happy endings, Zach. I well, love happy endings. I It just felt disingenuous because they like show you this memorial of this dog that like heroically it's not a mor- mor- it's a statue like he got a statue because yeah, he's such a great dog. Yeah, they memorialized him because he, he died uh very heroically saving people and that was like the reason why one of the reasons why this culture that had been so built up against dogs could finally like see the value in them or you know it's like it's like that sort of a thing and then they they just sort of uh you know go down uh the camera goes down and like oh nope fooled you it wasn't i don't know i i liked that i we don't this is a little bit of a tangent and also a, a spoiler for another movie but uh you're familiar with rampage that just came out yeah an article came out i don't know if you saw this where the rock was talking about how they wanted to spoilers for this so don't listen to this if you want to watch rampage but i'm not they, listening no I'm <laughs> they wanted to kill the monkey at the end that is his, his best friend and the rock is like no if you're gonna do that find another actor 
And he basically wouldn't let them kill the monkey in the end because he says he has developed this trust with audiences because when they go to his movies, they want to have a good time. They want a happy ending. And he's developed a brand of being very positive and having feel-good movies. And I love The Rock. And I wish that more movies... I feel like movies just like to be important need to have like a sad downer ending but i don't, I don't want that i, don't I just think it's i want happy downer. all the time it, well i don't think it's a downer i know you like hate anything that's like a little bit of a downer and like it's true you want the but like the what uh, what would i guess what would you say the the rock has in common with a wes anderson movie because they're both auteurs Okay, one's an actor, but... Well, I don't know, man. He's very passionate about his work, and he really gets in. I think he's had some writing credits in some of the movies he's worked on. Yeah. Well, anyway, like, I am not opposed to, like, characters dying in a movie because, uh, like, there needs to be some sort of, like, emotional weight to things as well. Zach. I don't need a a happy ending every time is what I'm saying. Can you imagine... A collaboration between The Rock and Wes Anderson? I mean, what would that even look like? I want a Fast and the Furious movie directed by Wes Anderson. I think that would be amazing. I mean, I would be very interested to see what he did with it, but at the same time, I think they're so like far apart from like what they are interested in doing, uh, both stylistically and thematically, that I'm not even sure that that would work. I would love to see it. If we had more like manpower and money and time and skill, I would say we should do a parody like trailer of a Fast and the Furious directed by Wes Anderson. Yeah, you see a lot of those actually. A lot of like what if Wes Anderson directed this movie and they're mm-hmm. they're usually like not very good. I feel like if we had the budget, we could do something really cool. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, back to this. I There are very few things I hated. I was engaged the entire time. I was a little bit taken out of it whenever we had to follow around the foreign exchange student, like doing stuff in Megasaki, because I wanted like more dog time. I like we kind of went away from the core group of dogs of like Bill Murray and Edward Norton and everybody, and I wanted more of them. I wanted like to figure because they were just like on that conveyor belt for a good. 15 minutes where we weren't seeing them (laughs) yeah that was another thing i was going to mention as one of my criticisms is that there was almost too many characters Mm. and so like um chief and uh, atari are kind of like the main focus of the movie Mm -hmm. and uh especially chief kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit towards the end because there's it has so many characters to balance by then um but yeah, I don't know. I think it did a good job. So another one of the uh, things people are talking about, the sort of a controversial choice in the movie, is to not have any of the Japanese be like translated or like subtitled. There was subtitled Japanese. I mean, occasionally, but like as far as like the speaking voices go, like or mm-hmm. speaking voices, yeah, that's that's good. Uh, like the the speaking parts. Uh, most of those were not translated, but I didn't have an issue with it because um, either there was a translator there because uh, they're like, um, what's her name from uh, that movie that this is not helping you. Hang on. <laughs> Frances McDormand. She did mm-hmm. the voice of the uh, interpreter uh, for like the newscast or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then um, uh, l- like... Everything else seemed fairly clear to me. Um, like when Atari was speaking to the kids, uh, or the kids, the the dogs, like that all was made fairly clear through like gestures and um, just the context of things that, mm-hmm. that it never really became an issue to me. Uh, anyway, so you didn't, you didn't find it... Uh, a problem at all that there wasn't uh like it wasn't i guess subtitled when atari spoke because i know i thought that was good because they like they couldn't speak his language yeah so to me it was uh representative of sort of that gulf between dogs and humans and i agree uh like 
you have to sort of earn an understanding between the two because it said at the very beginning there's like a title card that says um like the the japanese uh will you know not be translated or whatever and the dogs will all be um dubbed in english so uh, they're they even sort of are self-aware about it that it's even the dogs like you're hearing english from them but you're supposed to imagine that they're just sort of barking and we're just getting that translated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, there's also that moment where uh, towards the end, as they're like transferring, I guess, ownership uh, between the dogs, like Atari and the, the two dogs. And he mm-hmm. like passes that earpiece to him. And then he sort of receives that, um, that uh that understanding where they can sort of understand each other uh as they're talking you know Mm -hmm. there's like that translation so i thought that was a nice moment where they there is that and it is kind of one of those emotional moments that you talked about where you well up a little bit because yeah i had plenty of those in this yeah so i thought that one was probably the one that maybe touched me the most i would say of all wes anderson movies i've seen this is the movie where I got teary-eyed the most times. I can see that. I don't know that I get teary-eyed a ton in Wes Anderson movies, but you don't really. But this one, at least that one moment, I thought was really good. I found there were a bunch of moments like that. Well, so the other thing is, uh, maybe this is a mark against the fact that they don't uh, translate Atari at all. Uh, but because you don't really hear from him ever or what he's like thinking and feeling at any given time, it sort of feels like they're like they, they kind of needed to because they're, that's sort of the point, but they're also Mm -hmm. in doing that. They're also kind of keeping him at arm's length a little bit, which I, I thought made it a little bit harder to be invested in some of the emotional moments involving him. But yeah, I could see that. But um, I think most of them worked anyway. I would be interested to watch this movie again with Japanese subtitles, if possible. I'm sure maybe when it comes out on Blu-ray, there will be an option to do that. Maybe, yeah. I'd be interested to see uh, if any of that makes a difference. Um, Oh, the other bizarre choice that needs mentioning is people have taken or... I had a, an issue with the foreign exchange student, like the role of that character in this movie. Who is she voiced by? Uh, Greta Gerwig, I believe. I don't know that I've seen her in anything. Uh, I like Greta Gerwig quite a bit. I like her. She's a, She just directed something everybody likes, right? Yeah. Um, Bird. What, what's that? Oh, she directed Lady Bird? Yeah, Lady Bird. She oh, got nomina- that. nominated for an Oscar. First, That's crazy. And that was was that her directorial debut? Uh, might have been. I'm not sure. She may have directed something else. I know she's been in a lot of Noah Baumbach movies. Uh, like she was in Francis Ha and did not see that. I don't know. I li- I like her a lot. I've liked her in everything I've seen her in. Um, Do you know what I don't like about Noah Baumbach movies, Zach? Um, they're not happy all the time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It's like if you took a Wes Anderson movie and really cranked up the misery. Yeah, sometimes it's a bit too much for me. Um, I'm fine with it sometimes, but I'll agree Noah Baumbach tends to be a little too morose for my taste some of the time. But uh, I don't know. I can I can enjoy some of his movies, but some of them are too much. Too much. I think I've only seen The Squid and the Whale and... Uh, I feel like I've seen one more. Oh, Margot at the Wedding? No, that's not a no Bombback movie, is it? What am I thinking? Yeah, of? it is. Oh, I get that movie confused with uh, Rachel getting married. <laughs> What's Rachel getting married? This movie that we don't need to talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they're both about a wedding and they have a name in the title. All uh, right. Um, anyway, there's a lot of other themes in the movie, but people get focused on like the appropriation and the fact that there's this foreign exchange student that, uh, uh, kind of doesn't even need to be in the movie 
Like it could have just been like a Japanese student, but I guess at the same time you kind of need that English language. Yeah, if they weren't going to subtitle any Japanese, there needed to be a lot of exposition that happened uh in a high school or just like not being translated by Francis McDormand. So they they needed an English feature speaker. So that was like I guess necessary for the well, narrative they wanted to tell. But that's that's them backing themselves into a corner. They could have just that's they could have just had subtitles. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree that uh that character maybe could have been Japanese and did not need to be I mean, I found that character fine. I was fine with all of her stuff. Well, I was fine with it mainly because Atari was still like the main um guy. He was the the one that made all the change and he was the one that um like really stepped up and took the initiative to actually fly over there. So I, I don't think it's as much a problem of like the white savior that a lot of people are making it out to be. But uh I can see why people would take issue with it. I guess I really just don't like like plucky kid characters. Well, but that that's the thing about Wes Anderson movies is they're all plucky kid characters. They're all yeah, about I guess that's they're true. all about the kids that know better than the adults and the adults are as essentially uh like um stuck in a state of arrested development. You know, they uh sort of never matured past a certain age and they're always messed up and they need the kids to come along and uh help them fix their lives i guess yeah i guess that's true that's a pretty frequent theme uh and in this one it's more of like innocence against corruption uh because it is like uh it's a pretty interesting theme of like rebellion against like authoritarianism and there's like a bit of like fake news and rejection of science in there as well Mm -hmm. um so there's a lot going on um that i think is interesting and worth sort of um I guess praising the movie for like having those interesting themes, but they see again, they seem to be getting lost um, because of other things, but yeah. Uh, Also. So the, the dog illness that needs to be cured, um, it's just sort of a thing that's happening in the background the whole time. And like the most that comes of it is the dogs like sneeze every once in a while. Yeah, I thought that was going to be more of a ticking clock, but there's never really any degradation of any of the dogs. Yeah, it's like a missed opportunity to add, like, some tension in there. Um, I think the main thing it was supposed to do is make the dogs unsafe for society. And so once they cured them, it meant, because it was like, they made a big deal of, like, how dog flu was uh, very close to bridging the gap between uh, dogs and humans, where, like, it would start causing human illness. So... It's kind of an I am legend type situation. Right. And yeah, it was part of like that fake news. Because so, didn't they also like infect the dogs? Yeah, they, they infected them and like made them breed a lot and made them have this terrible virulent disease. But like when he was able to cure the dog on stage, people were like, oh, okay, so dogs are safe to own again. Well, uh, but also um, that's why I kind of was on board for them letting um what's his name spot um sacrifice himself because he um did something to save a human which is also like another reason to because dogs do that right and re- like they fight on behalf of their masters right when they will step in when they feel like their masters being threatened so i thought it was a you know, kind of a good thing that was sort of based on, like, real pet behavior. Yeah, I agree. All, and all the humor worked for me. Like, every time they made a joke, I thought I felt like it landed. Yeah, I, I did as well. And I laughed at the movie, and I, I didn't find that there were uh, obvious moments where it wanted us to laugh, and it uh, didn't work. So. Yeah, I especially loved that running gag that with uh, Jeff Goldblum's dog, where he kept like hearing about things. Yeah, yeah, they had nice little things like that. Um, I like Jeff Goldblum and like Bill Murray, so having them in the movie always helps. Yeah, I agree. All in all, a great movie. All and is all. my review. Yeah, uh, I like also that. So, um. 
because Wes Anderson is so like meticulous with detail, like there's even those moments where they like take time to stop and watch them like meticulously make some sushi and like yeah that was a great scene and then like later they do the same thing but with like uh the kidney operation Mm -hmm. it's like you don't expect to see them like take the time to do that but uh but yeah like such meticulous detail like you can see like fleas crawling around on like the dog's fur i thought it was uh if possible uh animation wise even better than fantastic mr fox even if you had a problem with it i guess um yeah i would actually i would agree with that i am trying to think of i feel like i didn't have this problem with fantastic mr fox and i feel like maybe they like they what is the word intentionally did go for more of like a lo-fi like whenever like there was a big use of uh cotton uh to replace smoke and yeah. like mist and steam so they did go for like a kind of a lo-fi animation which worked and i thought was a good choice but uh i don't remember i feel like i remember uh, fantastic mr fox being a cleaner production i feel like they did that a lot in fantastic mr fox maybe they as did. well i have not seen that for years maybe it wasn't as much because they they like every time a dog gets into a fight, it just becomes that really cartoony like cloud of dust, and like every now and then you'll see a limb pop out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like that. Yeah, which I I think is fun. Uh, but the, yeah, they do it a lot in this movie, so you do maybe notice it a bit more than maybe mm-hmm. in Fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, but yeah, I also liked that whenever like you're actually seeing the TV. Um, cause there's always seems to be this like television production going on. And so yes. every time you watch like a, a TV news report, it's like in actual like hand-drawn animation rather than like stop motion. Yeah. That was a nice touch. Yeah. I thought it was a, a nice little touch they did. Otherwise. Closing thoughts. Um, I enjoyed it. Had a few minor criticisms, but overall, I really enjoyed it, and I would definitely watch it again. Uh, not your, not my favorite Wes Anderson movie, but I still liked it a lot. Your favorite movie of 2018 so far? Uh, Probably. I don't think I've seen that many movies this year, actually, sadly. Where, 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 Annihilation? I didn't get to see it. I want to see that movie, but I didn't get to. Oh. I've been very busy. You have been very busy. I did see Ready Player One. I would definitely put this movie above that one. <laughs> um, where where do you rank it? Where, I guess what have you seen? Um, I feel like I have seen more than Ready Player One and Annihilation, but I am blanking on what else that I've seen. I would say it probably is my number one movie of 2018 right now, but of course, you know, next week is Infinity War. Yes, uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. That'll um, be our next uh, Starside Flicks, I would imagine. Probably, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even mind uh, going to see Rampage and talking about that, but... Yeah, I would love that. Uh, I, th- I feel like there was another movie that came out fairly recently that I wanted to see that I haven't gotten around to yet, but... Anyway, for sure we should do Rampage and Avengers. Yeah, we will. We should indeed. Anyway, what are your closing thoughts, or have you already given them? Uh, uh, it was great, and I loved it, and I laughed, and I cried, and it is not my least favorite Wes Anderson movie. It is maybe in my top five. It's not my least favorite uh, Wes Anderson movie either, just uh, not my favorite either. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Fair. Uh, take us out. Well, you've been listening to Starside Flicks, and if you'd like to like, comment, and subscribe, and uh, we have a Twitter and an Instagram that you can also uh, follow, and that's our brand. (laughs) If there's (laughs) other movies you want us to talk about, maybe we can do that as well. Please do. I would. I mean, we've been doing blindsiding for so or blindspotting for so long. 
maybe we do that with movies as well because uh, mm. have you ever seen Hackers? Uh, I have not. Zach, that's my favorite movie. I would love to do start a uh, films blind spotting uh, series. We'll have to come up with a pun, maybe. We'll think about it. Offcast. <laughs> we will come up with it now. We won't stop recording until we do. No, we can stop. That's <laughs> fine. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, go see Isle of Dogs. Yes, please do. Goodbye. Goodbye.